Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Pan Future Society podcast. Today is Saturday, September 9th, 2017. And uh, this week, I'm going to open the show with a little bit of uh, Carl Sagan's Pale Blue Dot, uh, partly in honor of the anniversary of Voyager's mission, but also as a reminder. I revisit these words often as a reminder of both how tiny and insignificant we are in the vast universe, and as a reminder of the wondrous things we can accomplish and the amazing places we can go in the universe and in our imaginations as a reminder uh, and as a reminder that we are all of us on this planet human beings, and that is nothing and everything. From his speech at uh, originally at Cornell University, uh, October 13th, 1994. To my mind... There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly and compassionately with one another and to preserve and cherish that pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you, Carl. Uh, Lots to catch up on this week. So, I have decided it's time for another all-news show. Uh, This is all-news show number three. I seem to hit these about every 20 episodes so far. Uh, Of course, there's always tons of stuff to cover every week that doesn't make it into the show. But every now and then, I just have too much cool stuff that's piled up uh, on my list or in my bookmarks or wherever I save these uh, things. And I just want to share it all. And uh, I try to find things, some some of the things uh, you may not have seen, some of them uh, definitely need a mention and everybody should know about them because they're all over the place. But anyway... Uh, What I'm bringing you today isn't everything that has come across the wire in the past month or so, but it's uh, a bunch of cool stuff that I've been saving up. So here we go. The first news item for this week I would like to bring to your attention is uh, some new studies that are showing uh, why people are so certain they are correct and why they hold so firmly to that belief. Uh, A study that basically dogmatism in different individuals, both in the religious and non-religious. And what is interesting is that uh, across this uh, spectrum, uh, pretty much anyone who holds a an extremely dogmatic view that is uh, one that they are so certain they are, that is right that no amount of evidence could ever change their mind uh, goes across the spectrum. Uh, it's not just religious people or just conspiracy theory people. Uh, it could be anybody. It could be you. Um, and uh, I'll link to the article, uh, as I always do for all the news stuff, um, but the point I'd like to take away from this is just to uh, take this as a reminder to always pause for a moment and uh, consider why you believe anything that you believe. And if you are presented with some information and you have this immediate gut reaction to dismiss it or uh, even it makes you angry, uh, pause for a moment and, and think about why you have that, uh, that reason. Um, you know, it doesn't matter where you fall on the spectrum of religion or non-religion or education or anything like that, uh, holding tightly to extreme viewpoints or to dog or being dogmatic about your viewpoints, uh, is, can be sort of hazardous to uh, functioning in society. And I think it's damaging quite a bit, uh, of our world right now. So uh, when you think something, or when you're confronted with something that is uh, opposite of what you think, pause for a moment, sort of step outside your own head, and think about why you are having that reaction. And uh, read about these studies that are uh, uh, playing this information out here. (laughs) 
Second news item today. Uh, the world could run out of food in uh, uh, two decades earlier than thought. So this might be news to you in general, that uh, the world uh, looks like it's going to run out of food. Uh, that's because our population growth is outstripping our ability to produce food. Um, the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization uh, predicts that by 2050, uh, the world's population is expected to reach 9.1 billion, and that we will need to produce 70% more food than we do today to feed all those people. Uh, some other uh, people are looking at the data a little differently and uh, have concluded that by 2027, the world could be facing a food crisis. Uh, Sarah Menker, founder and chief executive of Grow Intelligence, an agricultural data technology company, uh, says that by 2027, we could be facing a 214 trillion calorie deficit. Um, there's two, there's kind of two points uh, to, that I take out of this, this article here. One is that uh, Sarah Menker's point about this being a calorie deficit is an interesting um, approach because we don't usually measure food uh, or food shortages strictly by calories. Um, and that can actually, I think, be a more useful way of looking at this food deficit and what we do about it. Because ultimately you need nutrition and calories uh, in certain amounts. Um, and where you get those is less important, especially less important if you're starving. Um, another thing I would take away from this is this is another sign. It's a flag. It's somebody's waving a big red flag, um, that should be telling you not to reject modern farming technology. Yes. GMOs. That's what I'm talking about. Um, Another uh, little information popped up on on Twitter from one of the uh, food scientists I follow. In the 1970s in the United States, uh, corn growers produced about 100 bushels per acre. Today, they produce over 230 bushels per acre. That's what modern food science will do for you. There is absolutely no way that we can feed the world with organic gardening. Uh, we cannot all just have a garden in our backyard and share our food and all have enough. Not going to happen. We can't even just eat local. I grew up in Wisconsin. And I'm going to tell you, I cannot imagine how miserable people would be uh, in Wisconsin when uh, eating local would mean uh, potatoes and beets uh, and deer venison for eight months out of the year. Because there's winter there. Um Anyway, now I'm ranting. <laughs> so uh, take a look at this article. Consider consider where you get your food. Consider how your food is grown and consider supporting um, agricultural technology so that we can both uh, have enough and uh, reduce our impact on the environment while we're coming up with all these calories. Speaking of uh, environmental impact, an article from uh, BBC, How the Demand for Sand is Killing Rivers. As considerate, you cannot have concrete without sand, and riverbeds are being dug up across Africa to fuel a building boom with little thought for what this means uh, for those rivers and the people who depend on those rivers. So there is such a massive uh, boom in building in Africa and other places uh, in the world that the demand for sand, of all things, is becoming a, an environmental threat on par with open pit mining. Um, the article goes into quite a bit of detail about where it's used and who's getting it. Um, there is even a black market for sand harvesting. And there are sand mafias. It's kind of mind-boggling to think that sand is a commodity in that has, has come to this point. But it is. And concrete is so universal. 
But as I have mentioned on some previous shows about some material science, um, there are people working on better ways to make concrete and people working on things that can be alternatives to concrete that do not have this kind of impact. So again, just, just in general for everything, I could close every, every segment uh, with this. Just support science because that's how we're going to figure out how to fix this. To, to just simply ban people from making concrete is not going to work. You're asking people to revert to a pre-industrial agrarian society across the world, and that's not going to happen. Um, if you if you order them not to dig up rivers for sand, uh, they'll get it on. You know, they'll have a black market, or they'll steal it, or there will be wars over sand. Who knows? I mean, I thought the next major war would be over water, but maybe it'll be over sand of all things. Um, so, yeah, that's read the article. Um, you know, this is and this is one of those environmental um, issues which I think people in America and people in affluent nations don't fully understand. You know, it's it's just like the the, uh, the rainforest in the 1980s. We told everybody you can't cut down the rainforest anymore. So all the poor people who eked out a living cutting down trees, uh, cut them all down and turned them into terrible grazing lands instead. Um, the people who are making a living harvesting the sand don't have much else to do. So just ordering them not to do it is not a good solution either. Scotland will begin funding a universal basic income experiment. Uh, there are a number, uh, a handful of countries uh, beginning to seriously consider universal basic income and are considering some uh, trial runs of various types, uh, including the U.S., Canada, Germany, Finland, and some others. Uh, also, Nobel Prize winners and Silicon Valley innovators, and even some heads of uh, large corporations are behind this idea. Now, uh, universal basic income is a topic that I have not gotten into on the show yet, uh, but would like to. But in essence, it's a guaranteed level of income for everybody, uh, I would assume, of adult working age in a country. Um, and this is coming more, and it's, it's an idea that's come up off and on over the years, but is coming really to the forefront now because of the growing automation, which uh, with robotics and AI, uh, we're seeing jobs disappearing. And in the past, when new machinery has killed jobs, new jobs have arisen. But I think fundamentally, this era that we are entering into now is different, and a lot of the jobs that are going to disappear and be done by machines are not going to be replaced by something else. Um, and I think UBI is a way that we can at least partly start to address the massive income inequality that we have as well. Um, this is not meant to be a free ride. People who decry UBI as just a welfare handout or something like that don't really understand what it's for or why people are doing it. Um, but it, it is also true that something uh, nationwide has never been done like this. Uh, so we're going to have to... I, I think this is one of those things that we'll also just have to try it and see if it works. Um, so Scotland is going to do a little test, and we'll see how that goes. Good luck. Here's a little cool robotics news. Uh, someone has uh, developed a robot that can spray paint giant murals. Uh, Estonian inventor Mikhail Jola uh, says he doesn't have an artistic bone in his body but he wanted to make art anyway. Uh, he painted a 30-meter-high mural on an industrial chimney thanks to a robot armed with spray paint. Uh, he fed an image into a computer, which converts uh, everything into a series of dots, 
and uh, each dot has its own coordinates, and the robot pulls itself up and down on the chimney uh, on some wires for 14 hours, uh, spraying different colored dots as it went. I will link to uh, the article has a video of this and its finished product, and it's it's pretty cool. Uh, this guy has also invented a sort of a version for home use. Um, it's a device which goes on top of a spray can and talks to your smartphone uh, so that you can paint things on a wall. Uh, basically just aim aim it at the wall and the phone does the work for you and this little device. Uh, so in some ways, uh, as a musician, I've seen this kind of thing uh come to music a long time ago. Uh, it's been part of music for a long time, some technology that allows anybody, even people without any musical sense whatsoever, to make some kind of music. Um, more and more, we're going to see that with every everything. Uh, uh, interesting that this would also include uh, 30-foot-tall murals. Uh, so check out the video. It's pretty cool. And now... It came... From outer space. First item in space news this week, uh, as you've probably heard, the Voyager spacecraft, Voyager 1 and 2, are celebrating their 40th anniversary, launched in 1977. These craft are both now farther away from the Earth than they are from Pluto. They are a long way out there. There's tons of news about this everywhere, so I won't rehash a lot of stuff, but I will let you know that uh, there's a NASA Tumblr page that I found. It gives a great rundown of all the technology that's on these things. Um, they were, for, for 1960s and 70s technology development, they are crammed to the gills with stuff. Uh, magnetometers, radio telescopes, high gain antenna, uh, lower energy charged particle detector, cosmic ray detector, plasma detectors, ultraviolet spectrometers, uh, cameras, <laughs> um, a radio astronomy, uh, plasma and plasma wave antennas. Uh, there's diagrams here on this page about everything that is jammed into these. And um, just uh, also an incredible testament to the to the technical ability of of NASA over the years, um, they've had their mistakes and they've had their stumbles. But with uh, particularly these unmanned craft that just keep you know, Voyager or Opportunity or Cassini or whatever it is, they just keep going and going. So uh, happy launch birthday, Voyager one and two. Also, uh, back from space uh, recently, astronaut Peggy Whitson. You may have seen some of this. Uh, she set uh, quite a few records. Um, she just came back from the International Space Station, and she has completed a record 665 days in space. That is more than any American astronaut and more than any uh, woman worldwide. Um, not only that... But she was the first female commander of the ISS, also the world's oldest female astronaut at 57, and the most experienced uh, spacewalker out there. She has a record of uh, 53 hours and 22 minutes of spacewalking time throughout her astronaut career. That's just incredible. I mean, just put that in perspective for a moment and, and consider that that is uh, a little over two days of total spacewalk time. So, congratulations, Peggy. Welcome back to Earth. Continuing with the space news, NASA uh, has plans for a mission to return uh, samples from Mars. Uh, this would be a uh, Mars rover, uh, perhaps landing in 2020, arriving at Mars in 2021, um, would collect rock and soil samples and then store them for a future return uh, to Earth. However, so far, no plan uh, has been solidly developed on how uh, those samples would be returned. But very recently, there is a new uh, push to develop a plan 
to get those samples back as soon as possible. Uh, they've now at least uh, attempted to nail down a deadline to 2026. So after the Mars 2020 rover uh, does its thing, collects samples, uh, they're planning to have it leave samples in retrievable places and then uh, in 2026 have uh, another craft pick those up and return them to Earth. Um, I hope that all works out, and it would be utterly fascinating to actually actually have some of this back on Earth to, to, to study. The rovers themselves are incredible, and all the things we've learned about Mars are really quite amazing. Um, but there's nothing quite like uh, hands-on, uh, as hands-on as it could probably be with, with uh, isolation gloves and all that stuff that they would use with these things. But uh, I can't wait. While we're out there, uh, going to Mars and back to the moon or wherever, you know, we ought to clean up after ourselves. Uh, yes, space debris is, is a problem. Um, and, uh, scientists and uh, astronauts are concerned about it. There are 500,000 pieces of known space debris, uh, hurtling around the planet at 17,000 miles an hour. This is all stuff, dead satellites, bolts, tools, leftover stuff from past missions, even flecks of paint are considered in, the, in this. And, you know, you might think, oh, it's just tiny little, tiny little things don't matter. Well, uh, even the tiniest thing going 17,000 miles an hour can do a lot of damage. So it's generally a concern, and there have been a number of proposals on how to clean up some of this junk. Uh, none have been launched yet, but a new one came across my desk, desk this week. Um, this past spring, the NIAC, uh, NASA Innovative Advanced Concepts Program, awarded researchers at the Aerospace Corporation in El Segundo, California, 500000 to continue development of an unusual-looking spacecraft that's meant to mop up small pieces of space debris uh, almost like a space vacuum cleaner called brain crafts that's b-r-a-n-e these small ships are about a yard across but thinner than a human hair each one would wrap around a chunk of debris and then yank it down into the atmosphere where it would heat up and be incinerated so that's a cool idea um, we should do that we should do other things to get space junk out of the way uh, but hopefully now that uh, the space junk problem is sort of at the forefront of a lot of minds, we will actually see some action taking place on this. So in the far future, far, far future, about 1.3 million years from now, our solar system will have two stars. Uh... A star named Gliese 710, which is about 60% the mass of our sun. And this is projected to uh, cross through the boundaries of our sun's influence. Uh, way out in the Oort cloud, about 1.4 trillion miles away, that's about 16,000 times the distance from the Earth to the sun. Now, that's a long way, and uh, it really won't have much direct impact on us. Uh, it's not close enough to do anything like that. However, the main concern would be that it could disturb a number of the comets uh, out in the Oort cloud and could perhaps send a bunch of them hurtling into the solar system. Uh, events like this have happened in the past, and some people believe that this is related to mass extinctions and other things like that. However, there is no actual evidence um, for for that sort of influence uh, of these stars, whether they hurl comets at us or induce uh, massive volcanic eruptions. Um, scientifically speaking, that idea is more of a thought experiment than anything that has any remote evidence to it at all. 
However, uh, we'll just add this to the list of, of reasons we should be paying attention to uh, defending the planet from comets and meteors and things like that, because there are many ways in which they could be uh, hurled at us. <laughs> and there's a lot of them out there in the Oort cloud. So uh, let this be another reminder that uh, the universe really doesn't care if we're here or not. And uh, if we want to stick around and spread to the stars and understand the universe, we need to do what we can to protect ourselves. Um, 1.3 million years is a big number to wrap your head around, um, but there are other ways that this could happen at any time, and we should be working on these problems now, uh, at least more than, more than we are. The final item on the list of news this week, and we are finishing again in space, the end of the Cassini mission at Saturn is nearing. On September 15th, there will be a planned uh, entry into the atmosphere of Saturn to uh, destroy the craft, which is NASA standard procedure for these kinds of things because they don't want to risk uh, contaminating any environments out there, uh, having it crash into a, a moon or something like that. The Cassini craft, um, I, I highly advise you to go to the NASA page on it that I will link to. It has lots of great information. And uh, as I mentioned it in the uh, when I was talking about spacecraft durability, um, before. Cassini was launched in 1997, so it has been up there for nearly 20 years, and I believe the original mission was expected to last three years, so that is remarkable. Um, this Cassini craft uh, studying Saturn, its moons, and its rings, sending back fantastic data on all this also included the Huygens probe, if you remember that. Shortly after it arrived in the Saturnian system, uh, this probe was launched and it landed on Titan and sent us back some fascinating data on Titan, which has uh, oceans of methane and <laughs> an atmosphere not friendly to humans, but uh, an atmosphere nonetheless. And... Um, you're reading about this one and about the Voyager craft just kind of put things in an interesting perspective to to consider how long these things have been around, too. Uh, Voyager has been in space for almost my entire life. Cassini has been in space for about half my life. Um, that's just a cool thought. Um, and I, I hope you, you think it's cool, too. I guess you wouldn't have listened this far into the show if you didn't. So thanks, Cassini, for all your wonderful data and images and science uh, that this craft has done. And again, as a reminder, September 15th will be the final descent into the atmosphere of Saturn. Thank you for joining me this week for this all-news show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, there was a lot. I could have gone on for an hour uh, about all these news tidbits. Um, and, uh, you know, you might have heard my neighbor's lawnmower there in the background a few times, but, hey, that's what a home-produced podcast is like. I know some people are really picky about that, but after, you know, almost 30 years as a musician... There are certain things I'm just not picky about. Um, if this was NPR and you were listening to a uh, nationally broadcast, professionally produced thing and you heard the lawnmower in the background, I'd, I would be kind of mad about that. But, hey, this ain't NPR. But uh, it is the Pan Future Podcast. And as always, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for supporting the show. 
Uh, those of you who chipped in on Patreon, I am eternally grateful for that. Uh, if you don't uh, have any extra cash, uh, I mean, even a buck a month would be great. But if you don't have that or if you don't want to, that's totally cool. Um, the show is and always will be free. And uh, if you want to support the show, otherwise share it with your friends, spread the word, um, turn people on to this kind of thing uh, if you think they would be interested or need to hear this kind of thing. Also, write a review on iTunes or wherever you get your show. iTunes is the big one because most people get their podcast from iTunes still. Um, and uh, that's... Oh, yeah, I always mention, uh, I almost forgot, panfuture.org. There's links to everything there, uh, the feeds, the YouTube, the Twitter, the Patreon page is there. If you want to just make a one-time donation, there's a donate link there as well. Uh, and like I always say, thank you so much uh, for joining me, and I will talk to you again in the future. <laughs>